Okay. Great. Thank you, Athena. So, um, hello, everybody. My name is Paul Bachelman. I'm the town manager. I'm going to convene this meeting. We will introduce ourselves. We will, uh, I will conduct an election for the chair. And then once the chair is elected, the chair will conduct the election for a vice chair. Then we will go through an updated budget projections and then have a discussion or report on budget status by the different three different elected groups uh, and then have a broader discussion and then public comment. So um, I'll, I'll call on people and you can introduce and what's your role um, in, in if you're a member of the committee or not. So I'll start with Lynn. Hi, Lynn Griesmer, president of the Amherst Town Council, and I am one of the representatives for the Town Council to BCG. Okay, Andy. Oh, I'm Andy Steinberg, member of the Town Council and a member of the Finance Committee. Okay, Mandy Joe. All right, Councilor Haneke. Mandy Joe Haneke, uh, one of the Town Councilors and a member of BCG. Okay, Irv. Irv Rose, member of the uh, Amherst School Committee and vice chair. Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer Shaw, Amherst School Committee member. I was appointed to um, fill in for Bridget Hines, who is the other Amherst School Committee member on the BCG. She's not able to be here today due to a work obligation. Okay. Uh, Austin. You're muted. Austin, Sarah Jones, Library Board of Trustees, and I'm a member of the BCG. Bob? Bob Pam, a library trustee, treasurer, and member of BCG. Thank you. Um, Doug? <laughs> Perfect timing. Of course, the bell rings. So uh, it's lunchtime for somebody. Um, uh, so Doug Slaughter, interim superintendent at the schools. And do you want to introduce your staff? Yeah, I also have um, on, online is Jen Icorn who's doing some support work for us uh, this year in, in our business office and Shannon Bernacchia, who's uh, stepped up to be uh, uh, our uh, interim uh, director of finance. And Jen, and Jen, do you want to say hi? Hi there. How are you doing today? Great. And Shannon, so we can know we can hear you. Hi, how are you guys? Great. Thank you. Um, from our team, uh, Jen LaFountain, say hi. <clears throat> I and what your role is? Sure. I'm Jen LaFountain, mm -hmm. and I'm the treasurer collector. Mm -hmm. And Holly? Hi, Holly Drake, um, comptroller for the town of Amherst. Okay. Sharon? Hey, everybody. I'm Sharon Sherry. I'm the director of the Jones Library. And last but not least, uh, Sandy, welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm Sandy Pooler. I'm um, filling in, doing some help with the budget and capital this year, and it's nice to be back at BCG. My God, it's Sandy Pooler. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get everybody? So if you would know, Sandy... Um... Yeah, how about Athena? Oh, Athena, I'm sorry. Hi, Athena. Hi, everyone. I'm Athena. I'm the clerk for the town council, and I'm helping out on the budget process this year. Yes, yes. Thanks. Um, so as, as you may know, um, Sandy came on a couple weeks ago to help us uh, through this budget process uh, as while we're in the middle of looking for a new finance director where, you know, Sandy brings a boatload of experience as a, um, financial municipal finance expert in the state, but also he knows Amherst well because he was the finance director for the town of Amherst for many years, um, uh, and left about five years ago to go to the town of Arlington first as the deputy town manager and then the town manager and then retired and then um we went said hey retirement is boring isn't it um <laughs> come back and help us out for on a part-time basis which he is doing and we really really appreciate it the whole team does so thank you sandy um so the first of order of business is to elect a chair and i will conduct that process so the floor is open for nominations and it does not require a second to be nominated and you can nominate yourself after we do the nominations we will ask for people to vote by naming the person that they would like to serve as chair for this group so the floor is open for nominations andy i nominate lynn kreisberg lynn do accept the nomination I do. Okay. 
other nominations. I don't see other nominations. Are there any? Okay. I do not see any other nominations. Then um, I will go through the room and ask the people who are designated to vote to express their desire to vote for Lynn or or not. Um, so I'll start with Andy. A point of order, Paul, we usually, we usually let the nominee say a few words and then if anybody else wants to say anything before the vote. Okay. Lynn, do you want to say a few words? Uh, just very quickly. Uh, first of all, thank you, Andy. Uh, this is a role I've played in the past. Uh, although I have to say, as we go forward to this meeting, uh, I think the stakes are a lot higher. So I'm glad we're able to get together prior to the first to the Ford Towns meeting this coming Saturday. Great. Any other comments? Seeing none. And okay. then can we have a can we have a, a motion and second to elect um Griezmer as sure. chair? Thank you. Andy was is your motion to so moved. Second? second. I'll second. Okay. Um okay. So we will do the roll call vote. So I'll call Andy. Yes. Lynn? Yes. Mandy Joe? Aye. Irv? Yes. Jennifer? I will abstain. Austin? Yes. And Bob? Yes. So the motion passes. So you are now the chair, Lynn. Did you call on Irv? I did. Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. All right, the floor is open for nominations for vice chair of BCG. I I nominate Irv Rhodes. Okay, Irv, since you nominated yourself, we assume you accept. Are there any other are there any other nominations for vice chair of BCG? I'm seeing no other hands. Irv, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I, I have uh, been around town far more years than I can remember. And I've worked with every almost everyone here. Uh, I've, I've, worked, I've been on the finance committee uh, for the town. I've also served on the joint capital planning committee. Uh, and, and I am really uh, grounded in the finances of the town. And I really would enjoy serving as vice chair of this group. I'm going to make a motion that we elect Irv Rhodes as vice chair of BCG and seek a second. Second. Okay. And we'll go around. Um, I'm not, it's not an alphabetical order, but let me do the school committee people first. Irv? Yes. Jennifer Shaw. Yes. Uh, I'd like to move to the library. Bob Pam? Yes. Austin Surratt? Yes. And the town councilors, Andy Steinberg? Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Uh, Councilor Haneke? Hi. Okay. With that, we're going to move on to a presentation. Andy, I understand you're making the presentation with Paul. Uh, well, so Sandy. Yes, Sandy is, yeah. Sandy, I'm sorry, Sandy. So, so we'll just have to add an S to that. You're fine. Yes, to frame this, um, as we as we begin the budget process, we begin with the financial indicators process uh, presentation back in November, and then we show a projection of where we think we are financially for the town during the course of the coming months. As we continue to develop things, more information comes in. We refine that estimation, that estimate, and that's those projections. Just you know, because as you go through the course of the year, you get more clarity on who's saying what, what's what's going on with our income, with our finances, our um, you know, what our revenues are looking like, things like that. So we're at a point now where we'd like to share the latest version with the BCG. Um, and this will continue to develop over time as we learn more about the state budget and things like that. And we use the exact same format every year. We've been using it the same format for multiple years, so it, um, but we'll, but Sandy can walk it through, walk through because some people they have not seen this before, so it might be helpful to be a little more detailed than you normally are, Sandy. So you want to take it over? Hi everybody, um, let me just ask first off: Are these numbers big enough for people to be able to see? At my age, yes. 
Okay, they, they passed the grease mark test, so we're going to move <laughs> forward. Um, so these numbers, uh, first we'll go through revenue and then expenses, um, and they reflect uh, pretty much the latest numbers, the complete numbers that we have, including the cherry sheets from the governor's budget, uh, updated health insurance, uh, pension assessments, uh, and some updated capital numbers. Um, so just to walk through, our forecast starts with our biggest source of revenue, which is property taxes. This is all set by Prop 2.5. Uh, we start with the previous year's uh, levy, the maximum amount the town is allowed to tax under law, add 2.5%. And then we make an estimate, which has been fairly consistent over the years, of new growth. In other words, new buildings that are going to go up in town uh, or major uh, renovations that add things that hadn't been taxed before. That's at 650000 As I say, it's um, a little bit lower than what you've seen in actuals for previous years. But that's consistent with how we do forecasting because we don't know what that number is going to be still for several months until uh, the assessors have assessed all new things in town that have, have been built as of January 1st. That, that takes them several months to do. So we have a 3.5% increase in property taxes, which is typical for Amherst. Uh, you can ignore this number here. Um, in fact, why don't I just get rid of it? Oops. Um, that means uh, we have... Uh, $66 million in taxes, so 3.6%. We then go through our local receipts. Uh, these pretty much uh, are similar to what we had. In fact, they are exactly the same. That was in the financial indicators. Some things have gone up, uh, for example, motor vehicle uh, excise based on actual uh, collections of those taxes over the last few years. Other things have uh, stayed stable, like... Uh, like penalties and interest or rentals and so forth. Uh, we think there's going to be a slight increase in uh, hotel, motel, and meals taxes. Uh, we know from agreements we have that we have pilot payments, payments in lieu of taxes from various sources. Um, rentals are not expected to change. Uh, departmental revenue, which uh, it's never, you know, we don't haven't changed our fees or fines or things very drastically, um, so that's going to stay the same. Uh, looking at license and permits, they've been up pretty high, and we look at a three-year average. Uh, special assessments, also from known agreements. Uh, investment income, we boasted by boosted by about thirty thousand um, dollars, and then uh, miscellaneous are again from sign contracts, things with UMass and so forth that we are fairly confident in, in having come in. So we have an 8% increase in uh, local receipts, which for Amherst, frankly, is, is a good uh, increase in local receipts. Uh, again, you saw that all in the financial indicators back in the fall. State aid is now new. Um, that This is based on what was in the governor's budget. We have Chapter 70 with an allocation of $30 per student, which is about a half percent. Uh, Amherst never gets a lot of Chapter 70 increases um, because we have a fairly steady enrollment um, and because the major driver for Chapter 70 aid these days is something called the Student Opportunity Act, which really focuses on giving additional state aid to some of the poor communities in the state. Um, the other Significant increase was an increase in unrestricted general government aid, otherwise known as UGA. The governor, uh, notwithstanding the fact that her projection for state revenue growth is less than 3%, pegged UGA at a 3% increase. She announced that at the um, MMA meeting and then when her budget came out. Uh, so that's a nice number for us. Um, the other things are fairly small and frankly not particularly significant so that the overall increase in state aid from what we thought we were gonna get back in uh, November is about $240,000. Other sources look like they're going down only because last year uh, 
kind of not part of the basic budget. There were a million dollars in free cash and $5 million in stabilization fund. Uh, otherwise, things um, are essentially uh, pretty much the same from last year. So uh, overall, we have a $96 million, $96.5 million budget. Before I talk about spending, let me ask if there are any questions about the revenue figures. Jennifer. Hi, thank you, Sandy. So, sorry, this is my first time participating in PCG. Um, what was the free cash and stabilization, the 1 million and 5 million from this current year, what was that for? Uh, there was some additional money for uh, roads and sidewalks for some capital. And uh, there was money put from the stabilization uh, to build the new elementary school okay. uh, because of increased costs and they had to be amended. Okay, so those, the sorry, can you move your mouse so I can see that? Th thank you. So because of those things, it looks like our overall revenue is down 3.4% or it is down 3.4%. It, it, it is down, but um, I would say don't pay attention to that, or I could recalculate it in a way, because the thing that's really essential on this sheet is not so much for how we compare to our final from last year, uh, which we have to put under this category called recap, which is the, um, the form that we have to file with the state when we set the tax rate every year. That's called the recap sheet. And so we have to include all this stuff in it. What's really important on this sheet uh, is how much revenue we have versus what we're going to spend. Um, we could do a calculation based on the original budget without those additions if that was important. Um, but I'd say I would focus more on whether we have enough money to cover our spending, if that's okay. helpful. Thank you. OK. Um, Lynn. Jennifer, I think that was a good question. I just want to point out that both of those decisions for those additional monies were made outside the regular budget process. Uh, one was when we were actually doing the school discussion, and the other one was when we uh, got our receipts. And so as we look at last year's budget prior to those two amounts, you don't see as drastic a difference. Very good. Andy? And I think the other thing to note is those were allocations that were for very specific purposes, and those are non-recurring purposes. Exactly. All right, I'm going to keep going forward then. Um, so we have what's coming in, now what's going out. The most significant change on this forecast is that as opposed to the projection back at uh, financial indicators report, we had a, at that time a 3% increase in spending. Uh, we now have put in a 4% across the board increase for uh, all four major categories, towns, elementary school, regional school, and the Jones Library. Um, we did that because uh, as you'll see in a minute, we have some better news on some things than we had before. I'd already mentioned the um, increase in revenue uh, from the cherry sheets. Um, there are a few decreases in uh, spending that we had that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it means overall, um, we are able to come up with 4%. And so therefore, um, that's what uh, we are proposing to allocate, and it's up for discussion among this group as to your opinions on that. So overall, I would say this is uh, good news for the town and for the schools. Uh, the capital budget um, is coming in at, um, uh, well, $7.7 7 million. Uh, what we really focus on is that we're going to spend 10.5% of the tax levy on capital, plus there's some non-tax levy expenses up here. Uh, this number is up from what was in the financial indicators, um, not because the percentage changed, but just because um, we noticed that there was a uh, 
formula that was counting the 10% from two years ago, as opposed to the previous year. Uh, so when we corrected that, that increased our capital spending. Um, and then uh, a really big change here is that our retirement assessment is virtually equal to what it had been in the previous year. Uh, the previous year, there was a fairly normal increase. Uh, this year, it's, it's steady. So we, sh we would have expected to see about a half a million dollar or so increase in this line. Part of the reason uh, that that increase is not so big is a one-time event in, in that we measure uh, the number of people who are expected to get pensions every year on October 1st. Just take a snapshot on who's on the rolls and, and the retirement board then sends us based on that snapshot an estimate of what they expect to see uh, for expenses for the coming year. Uh, this year, that snapshot had happened to have several vacancies um, that will probably be filled a year from now, but it meant that um, the retirement assessment just came in lower than we had expected. So in any given year, you have to budget based on what the retirement board says. You, 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 uh, you, you by law, can't budget lower. Um, and... Um, so I would say for the FY26 budget, this number is likely to go up, but for FY25, what we're planning for now, it's it's good news. And, uh, and so we'll take advantage of that. And that is in large part what helped us increase from three to 4% in our overall uh, operating budget spending. Uh, the other things are just continuing to increase funding for OPEB by $50,000. That's the trust fund for health insurance for our retirees. Um, and then there are various unappropriated uses, most of which come from, uh, well, the biggest one comes from the state giveth and the state taketh away. They give a state aid, but then they net back out uh, things like um, the assessment for um, Pioneer Valley Transit Authority. Um, we set aside 1% of all the taxes we bring in every year for our uh, abatements, what's known as an overlay, in case people file for abatements, we have to be able to write them a check. Uh, there's some other offsets on the cherry sheet, specifically money that's going straight to the schools for uh, charter reimbursement, and then some minor things for uh, other things to be raised. With all that, it means um, the important number here is that we have, at this point, a positive balance of $21,000. Not a huge number. Uh, by town meeting, we will make that zero by, by tweaking these numbers because you have to have a zero balance budget. But it does mean that overall, um, the town's finances are strong enough to support the, the most important number, which is that 4% increase. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Andy Joe. Yeah, um, going back up to the retirement assessment, uh, my question is, you, you touched on this a little bit, FY26 won't be this favorable, but are we going to, should we be expecting an overly large increase in FY26? If you were expecting, say, a half million dollars from 24 to 25 and the snap snapshot gave, gave us zero, are we going to be looking at like a million dollar increase from 25 to 26? if the snapshot's not, or is it still gonna be about a half million? Like, like, yeah. That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, you know, it it's, these things are a little bit fluky sometimes because of, you know, who's on the payroll at any one time. If you look at the pattern over the last few years, um, you can see it's gone up, you know, 400,000, a little under 500,000, a little more than 500,000. So yes, I would expect it's going to be more than 5,000. I would also say a million is probably too high, but I I think there are gonna be constraints on the Amherst budget next year and the town's ability to fund things across the board is probably gonna be more limited. Uh, 
you know, so instead of a 4% increase, we may be looking at back at a three or a two and a half percent increase for FY26, but it's still very early. I'm not putting any of those numbers out as a prediction. I am saying though, that that 4% is kind of a one-time nice thing to be able to do. Holly, did you want to say something or? Um, no, I was going to, you know, more or less say the same thing. I, I certainly don't think that it would double, but I think that it would go back to more or less a normal uh, type of increase. It could be a little bit higher, um, but I, it, again, it is based on a snapshot. It is, and I'm sorry, I'm going to correct Sandy. It's as of September 30th. Anybody who is on your payroll September 30th, is what that it assessment is based on. You're off one day, Sandy, I'm sorry. <laughs> but they basically take everybody who is active in our payroll system as a um, full-time benefited, benefited employee in the retirement system, and they do a calculation off that. They do that for every city in town as well. So when they put it all together, who knows how it's going to shake out because who knows if other cities and towns had a lot of vacancies that now they're not going to have. So it's a, it's a very complicated formula for every single person in the retirement system. So it's, it's hard to judge. I expect it to be normal. I would not expect it to be double, but it, it is possible. It could be a little more than normal. Jennifer. Thanks. Can you scroll up so I can see the school line? Thanks. So, okay, wow, great. Okay, so again, I'm new here. You have to forgive me for this. So this 4%, is this new news as of today? Like, I guess, yes. but, okay, so my question yes. is maybe for the superintendent that we didn't know this even last night when we had our Amherst School Committee meeting. So this is like new, good news, right? <laughs> right? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Excellent question. I always like questions about good news. Bob. Typically in, in pension systems, if there was a deficit, it gets amortized over a 10 or 15 year period. Um, I would assume that, that that's true for, for the pension system we're in. And the question is, at what point will we have amortized that, that long-term debt? Um, under state law, all pension systems have to be fully amortized by uh, 2040, but each retirement system picks its own date. And Holly, I don't know if you know off the top of your head what that date is. For when yeah. the pension system is going to be fully funded. Oh. Jen's on the board. Maybe she knows. 32, 2032, 30, I think. 30. Oh, okay. Okay. 2032, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. That's what yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we more just, in that ballpark for sure. We just talked and, about it. Yes. Okay. And, and, then, how much? and they have a target that they try to hit. And then as they get closer, they sometimes have to adjust that year, which they have every ability to do as long as this before 2040. Okay. Uh, and how big is that nut? Uh, the the makeup payment? The overall liability? No. <clears throat> There's an overall liability portion of which is Amherst, and the question is, uh, how much of the amount that we pay out is towards that nut? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. I would yeah. ask one of the other staff people to follow up and, and get back because... That'd be fine. Thank you. Okay. Lynn? Thanks, Sandy. Uh, is our, does this retirement assessment cover all employees in the town, the library, and the schools? It covers all except teachers. Teachers are in a separate retirement system and are paid for by the state. But other school employees are in non teachers here. Yes. Okay. And then I. I just want to go back to um, the caution that I, I that I hope I think we're hearing, and that is that because of this aberration, if you will, in assessment that happened this year, um, we are able to have this good news today of the four percent. But it's not something that we can assume will show up in another year, and in fact 
probably more down at the two and a half to three percent. So I'm, and I know you're not predicting that, but I, I just want to make sure that, because um, this, this is a desired percent. It, it brings us up to the other um, contributors to the regional schools. So, um, it, but it's not something that we can see in the future. So thank you. Yep. Andy? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly point out that Bob Ham raised a good question about the retirement program and the fact that it will be, you know, we'll, we will retire that obligation. But um, we also have a huge obligation for OPEB, and there has been a long-term plan that when the retirement is uh, uh, fully paid off the retirement system, that we will then have the funds to make some serious payments into the OPEB trust to address that issue. Very good. Uh, Holly, did you want to say something? That is correct. And I was just going to, um, this is a little bit old, but um, I think that what Bob Pam might have been getting at and looking for is, um, I have a figure from the retirement system as of the end of FY22. I don't have an updated FY23 figure, but in FY22, the retirement system was approximately 78.5% funded already. You know, again, with investments, that number does go up and down, but they are doing very well towards their goal. And I think that it will be, they're in good shape to reach that goal by um, the FY32. And, um, and, like Andy said, we do have a plan in place, um, a long-term funding plan that once our retirement system is fully funded and our assessment goes down, that we're going to take at least a large portion of that difference and start socking that aside towards our OPEB liability as well. That is correct. Um, all right, Lynn? Yeah, I just wanna make sure that I'm looking at the mathematics correctly. If you look at the dollar change, say, for example, the regional school district, in order to understand how much this increases from the November meeting to now, you take $710,880 and you divide it by four. And the one, one fourth of that is the new increase. And so that would be about $177,000. That's exactly yes? what, That's exactly Thank what. Okay. Thank you. Lynn, would the same be true for the uh, elementary schools? In terms yes. Of that math? That's exactly right. Last fall, the original appropriation of the elementary schools was $777,000, and now it's uh, $1,037,000, so just short of a $300,000. Uh, increase, 250, let's say. I think, <clears throat> I think 250 is a little closer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm happy to leave this these numbers up here, but for um, conversation purposes, I was going to stop sharing so you could all see each other. And, and if people want to go back to the numbers, uh, please let me know and I'll be glad to put them back up. Um, so Lynn, I'll follow you. Oh, Bob, go ahead. One other question on the income side. Now, again, this is just my ignorance, I guess. Uh, on the interest that we earn on the money that we have, um, typically in the state, the, the limitations on what we can invest on basically produces income of like 1% or less. Um, is is there any, well, right. A, is that true? And B, you know, is there anything that we can do that would raise that? So um, there are limitations on how we invest this money that basically require that they be put into short-term, you know, one year or less investments. Mm -hmm. Because interest rates have been uh, for certain CDs up, you know, sometimes four or 5%, there's been an increase in uh, recent years in the interest income that Amherst and, and towns all across the state have had. So um, I, so 
we're likely to continue to get higher interest rates uh, until the Fed starts lowering those rates at some point. So we won't be in the half percent to one percent, which we've been in for several years. Uh, we'll be at a higher level. If I knew what that percentage was, I'd be investing in bonds right now, but <laughs> I don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so based on our agenda, we're now going to turn to each of the branches of our government and ask them to talk about where they are with their budgeting process and the status. And we'll begin that with the library. So I'll um, look to Austin and Bob and Sharon. Sharon, you want to say a few words for us, please? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> for us, um, uh, the, the health insurance has, um, that's what's hurting us the most right now. Um, the fact that we do not know where we're going to be uh, during the in, in, in the two year period that our construction project will happen. Um, that's making it hard for us to uh, nail down our budget for FY25. Um, also, as far as our annual fund goes, we rely very heavily on um, on an on an annual appeal uh, through the friends and those numbers because of the capital campaign. Those numbers have kind of leveled off, um, so uh, so that's where we stand. Uh, we're thrilled to get a four percent for next year. That will help us immensely. So that's that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Bob, do you want to add? Just that we are, are having difficulty projecting exactly what our expenses are going to be since we don't at this moment know where we'll be and what those costs will be. So um, it has been difficult um, actually projecting what it is now and what it's going to look like for next year. And can I... I'm, I'm going to ask others, but I'm going to just ask a follow-up question. But if others have follow-up questions for the library, please raise your hand. So are you suggesting that once we know where you're going to be located for the two-year interim, you will get a better handle on your budget for the next year or two? I hope so. So utilities are, are that's the big question mark. You know, um, I think wherever we go, uh, I think our utilities costs are going to go down quite a bit because our systems right now are so inefficient. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the unknown, really. It's the utilities. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions of the library at this time? Okay, then seeing none, I'm going to go on to the schools. Irv, Jennifer, uh, Doug, and your team of Shannon and Jen. Doug, you're up. Okay. Uh, so for the uh, Amherst Elementary budget, we did our budget hearing on, on Tuesday night. We had a follow-up discussion uh, last night. Uh, for the Amherst Elementary schools, uh, at a 3% increase, we had about a 500 and Four thousand dollar, five hundred three thousand dollar, a shortfall of expenses versus revenue for level services, um, and we were proposing the nature of, of of reductions and changes in our budget that that would try to close that, and had uh, extensive conversation over the last two two meetings about about those changes and what they were. Um, for the regional budget, um, we'll have a four towns meeting tomorrow, um, using the three percent you know guideline from earlier. Uh, and projecting out our, our level services, we were uh, about $1.88 million short of being in balance. And so uh, we've been working on how to close that, that gap in, in our, our funding and our revenue sources uh, for, for fiscal 25. Um, so, it, you know, this is, this is welcome news um, in, in regard to, uh, to the, uh, the regional budget, as well as the, the Amherst budget. Um, you know, there's a, Part of my brain that's wondering whether we could take some of the resource that would go to Amherst and, and perhaps use it for the region to help uh, reduce that a little bit further, uh, the gap in, in region a little bit further, because the, the changes to the programming are going to be pretty significant as a result of the size of the, the deficit we have. Um, and that's, you know, for you guys to discuss and 
the mechanics of that will work out if that's a, a reasonable possibility. But but either way, this is really great news. Um, just timeline wise for us, uh, we'll do a sorry for the bell. Um, we'll do our regional schools budget hearing on the 27th, which is the Tuesday after next week, which is a break week for us. And then on the 12th, uh, we need to vote the budget for region uh, because of uh, language in our regional agreement and when the first town meeting is and uh, and the Amherst budget will vote on the 19th of March uh, so that it's to the town manager for the deadline of April 1st. Okay, other people from the school committee or other uh, staff who are working with us in the schools I want to add to that what uh, question go I'm, ahead or yeah uh it's really great news in terms of the four percent uh for Amherst. um we were struggling with it the other night uh, and the number of parents and students who came forward in terms of our pr proposed cuts uh was tremendous uh, but one of the things that in terms of our, the Amherst schools that uh, when you look at our budget is that the second largest item in there is special education. And special education is, a, a, it's like everything else, the largest item in any budget is the item that you really want to go after if you want to start seeking cuts. Uh, it's just a natural sort of reaction, and that happened for us, but it was done well, uh, and, and it was explained why it was customer necessary. But the reason I'm raising that question, uh, the reason uh, I'm raising the, the issue is that special education is one of the biggest reasons for people moving to this town, and, it, and that particular item is one that we have to, uh, as a school committee, in the town, look at carefully as we go forward because it's such a large number and it affects such a, a large number of our students. I think it's well above 20% of our students are special ed. And so when people look at our budget, the school budget, uh, remember that, that large, there's a large section for special ed that we are obligated to deal with. We cannot escape it. Jennifer. I actually have a question. Um, we, so we've, we've gotten a lot of questions and pressure from the public about our two institutions of higher learning in town, UMass and Amherst College. And my question, maybe this is a question for the town manager, like what actually is the process for going to UMass and Amherst College and and you know as a school committee member do I just go to Chancellor Reyes and be like hey how about taking in a little more money like what what is the process how long does it take what does it look like and yeah those are my questions so for the university we do have a strategic partnership agreement that's in effect and it does have funds for the schools I can share that with you if you'd like I, um yeah so no I'm aware of that okay uh, if I mean anytime anybody gets more money you know we're always welcome to we were always We'll, re we'll welcome it um, if you if you have a good relationship with the chancellor and saying and you get them to write another check we'll say we'll cash it um, that's <laughs> typically we do go through sort of traditional channels in terms of those negotiations and it's and that's a, a, a an agreement that we made between the two institutions so um what is the t duration of the strategic partnership and like when does it get relooked at so it's uh, it's a five-year agreement that went back two years basically we're in the second we're in year two of a five-year agreement where we are right now so we have three um, more fiscal years okay and like who exactly negotiates and signs that agreement it's between the chancellor and the town manager okay so am i right in saying we have three more years before we can relook at it or revisit it or revise it well, that's that's what the current agreement states. Right. I mean, again, if there are things that happen and there are opportunities that present themselves, we're always open to that. It's not it's but this is the goal of this was to create create some predictability for both institutions as they budget and as, as we budget. So we know what money is coming in and they know what money to budget for. OK. And how about Amherst College? So we do not have a strategic partnership agreement with the college. Um, we continue to work on that. 
they have um, made some uh, donations to, they, they make a ongoing sort of contributions to the town and to this district now, um, but there's not, it's not governed by a strategic partnership agreement, but we want to get to that. Okay. And are, is that something that we're, you're working on with them? That's definitely. Okay. And just my last question, strategic partnership and pilot payment in lieu of taxes are just, are those like the same word for the same, a different word for the same thing? Or when, when people ask, why don't we have a pilot? Why doesn't UMass, is, is it, is that what the strategic partnership agreement is? So pilot payments from the, from the um, state institutions come through the cherry sheet and we are working at a state level uh, and the university has agreed with us that we would lobby at the state level to increase pilot payments. Uh, right now, I can get into the whole pilot payments because it's really um, unfair to the town of Amherst in terms of what the state provides in terms of pilot payments for state-owned land. They don't take into account the fact that there might be a building on it, for instance. Um, so a piece of forest land is given. So anyway, yeah. there's a whole formula, and, and and the university recognizes that and is willing to go to us with the, to the legislature to try and work on that. Um, the you know the colleges colleges don't there is there is no pilot payments from nonprofit institutions um again that's something that there is some legislation that um is being proposed to create to require um nonprofit institutions um with large endowments to provide uh, payments to either the state or to the localities so we're supporting that that's that's a that's not something i, I hold like is happening anytime soon um but yeah, I mean, I totally recognize that there are institutions in our community that could be contributing more to the town. Thank you. Are there are other questions regarding the school budgets. Okay, then I'm gonna go to Paul and Sandy and uh, Holly and um, uh, there's somebody else. I. The other, the other Jennifer, um, for the town budget. Yeah, so so we're in the process of doing our budget uh, um, review with our department heads. That's uh, Athena and Jen and Holly and Sandy are meeting with department heads, going through their budget requests. Uh, they understand the limitations that we have on our budget. There are an enormous number of needs for the town that you have articulated uh, in your in your goals, but also our town staff have articulated. So that's a um, page by page kind of analysis of the budget pro program that you have. That will come, uh, the schedule for the town is a little bit later than the, the schedule for the library and the um, school committees because they have to have their budgets in by April 1. We have to have our budgets in by May 1. So, but that's a process that's, that's, that's going on. Um, and sort of looking at the financial sheets, the personnel sheets and things like that. Holly, Jen, Athena, Sandy, anybody want to add on to that? I would just say we're going to hold meetings with each of the department heads during March, um, both to see if there are any changes uh, that they need to make sure that their programs are consistent with the goals set out by the council and the manager's priorities. Um, so I don't, since we haven't started that yet, I really don't know what might change department by department, but that's the process as we go forward. Are there any other comments about the town budget or questions about the town budget? Mandy Jo, I'm sorry, Councilor Haneke. Yeah, um, I, I just wanna, you know, when the schools put out their budget, they always, put out something called a level services budget that then shows cuts based on what funds might be available. The town does their budget documents slightly different. Um, it puts out what the funds are available and then tries to match them without necessarily showing the hard decisions that have been made to get to the number of a 3% increase or a 4% increase. Could you talk a little bit about how the strain on or the inflationary pressures have affected the town's budget? And are we facing, are you facing similar decisions in terms of meeting level services within a three or a 4% increase because of those items, even if it's not showing up in the documents that get presented to the council say? 
Yeah, so we do approach it differently. Um, we we know the number that we have to hit, and we and we work to hit that. We have the same budgetary pressures that every that the libraries and schools have. Health insurance, of of course, we we recognize that, but also just a normal inflation plus uh, contractual increases that have been given to employees, um, and trying to make those all fit within the constraints of the budget. There's also um, you know, if we want to maintain certain services, there's, the staffing levels have to be adjusted to make sure that we can get that. We're trying to do the best we can as we go through these meetings with department heads about what, you know, if, if you want to keep providing this level of service, um, we need to do, we need to provide the these these funds. The ch other challenge we have, and I think the schools have this as well, is we're, we're, we've been relying on ARPA funds for some positions and that will go away come December 31 of FY24. And so how we accommodate those positions that we've become accustomed to and utilizing in, a, in pretty significant ways, we have to figure out how to build those into the budget if we at all can. Um, you know, we also, um, in terms of the budget had to include the major new additions of four firefighters, which the council requested a couple of years ago and, and and integrate those into our budget plus the crest department and dei departments so those are all the pressures that we have to really accommodate them we've had sort of a a um a plan to implement them over time we've been fortunate to have some funds that we can offset that with, with either arpa or grants but that's that's where the trash that's where the pressure is going to be for our budget are there other questions about the municipal budget or comments So we've identified on our agenda for today that now we're into just a general discussion among this group. And after that, we will go to public comment. Uh, for the record, there are four people in the audience at this time, and uh, we'll uh, seek public comment if anybody has any. But um, please raise your hand if you have some general questions or comments. Um, about the process and how we move forward from here. Mandy Jo, Councillor Haneke. So I, I guess I'll I'll see if I start this off or not. Um thank you for the extra percent. I think that's been heard across the board. That's going to be hugely helpful to the town budget um, from my point of view as a counselor, but I think also school and library budget. Um, the council financial guidelines say to split that evenly. Um, so I, as a counselor, I think I'm still under that thinking that we would split that sort of extra increase evenly among to keep it 4% amongst all four entities that were shown on that, the region, the school, the elementary, the town, and the library. Um, I, I'm not sure I've heard anything to keep that different, although I did hear the superintendent say potentially that maybe he might ask school committees to split the 4% between the elementary and the region differently amongst those two entity, entities. Um, as a counselor, I would say almost if the total number comes in at whatever the total is with the 4% on each side, um, I'm not concerned as much as if that total number requires a lower number from the town or the library. Um, so that's sort of some of my thinking as a finance member, as a counselor, and as a BCG member to stick with the guide guidance of 4% across the board. But allow the schools a little leeway between K-6 and 7 to 12 by thinking about it as a K-12 sort of potential system from Amherst's point of view. Uh, I Before I move on to Andy, I also want to mention that Councillor Haneke is on one of the Mass Municipal Association policy committees and uh, Councillor Steinberg or Andy Steinberg is also on the finance one for the Mass Municipal. And Paul is actually now on the executive team for the Mass Municipal. So there's a lot of opportunity for them to carry some of the messages uh, that uh, we have about the budget forward. So Andy, please go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning that. I guess I might come back to that when I finish up what I was originally going to comment on uh, and ask. But uh, when the question that Mandy, uh, Councillor Haneke raised about um, whether money could be uh, used for either school system within the 4% increase for education. There is precedent for that. Um, it goes back some years, but um, we have, uh, you know, in town meeting days, the, the old finance committee did make it, that kind of adjustment when there was a request to do so. But it does create a complication, and that is, um, how do you transfer it when you have the assessment methodology? As because it, it can't be an assessment um, if, if, if you don't want to um, necessarily um, make adjustments that run across the towns by an agreed upon assessment method. I don't know, Doug, if you have any thoughts about that issue if it were to be proposed. So that was my question. Um, as far as the uh, MMA policy committee, we have been working on some of the issues that have been discussed in this meeting within the fiscal policy committee. And uh, I have been pressing uh, with a little bit of success on getting some conversation going about the um, pilot, state pilot, because of UMass and the fact that um, the way it's calculated is so unreasonable and got a little bit of language asking that um, the uh, state, uh, the Ways and Means Committees support looking into that issue and um, re re reviewing that matter. Um, the other thing that I have been working on very hard is um, the uh, $30 increase um, for Chapter 70. Uh, I probably spent more time on that during the past uh, six months or even longer um, through the entire last year of the committee talking about that issue because um, Student Opportunity Act, while well, it's a very important act and does fully support, um, has had this effect because the Student Opportunity Act names the $30 figure and the mass, uh, MMA's position is that it should be $100, not $30. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, I don't know if we want to, uh, I, I just uh, plant the seed and I will respect the decision that's made by the superintendent and the school committee, but if there's any possibility to have a little bit of discussion about that tomorrow with the four town um, and what we've been doing at the MMA, I think it might be very helpful. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I'll just follow up on, on Andy's uh, question about the, the uh, sort of additional resource. So if, if, for example, we took a half a percent, uh, you know, in, you know, the region went to four and a half percent and Amherst Elementary went to three and a half percent, those don't exactly work out to even dollars, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, so the totality is is a four percent is shared across the two. Uh, if we do that now as part of the conversation, uh, essentially with the four towns tomorrow, um, we can bake that into the assessment. There's two towns that are already at the guidelines. So just to I should paint this picture for the broader audience that don't necessarily follow the regional agreement so much. We have an assessment method we've used over the last couple of years that has uh, some guardrails that limit the maximum increase or decrease uh, for any one town to 4%. Um, and so two of the four communities are at that. So if we were like, let's say the increase for Amherst assessment was able to go to four and a half percent, there's nothing precludes that. And the only town that would be uh, looking at a number that's different than what we talked about a couple of months ago uh, would be Shootsbury. And I haven't run the numbers to see what that is, but but uh, they're under 2% right now. And so it would make their increase, you know, maybe two and a quarter or whatever. So it would, it would fit, uh, I think, but I think it'd be part of the conversation with the four towns tomorrow. If we were to um, 
uh, you know, use the four percent and then you know want to do you know an additional bit of funding for the regional schools separately later, sort of external to the to the um, assessment method. That would be more. And we did this, I think, during the middle of the pandemic. There was a a, a small you know, sort of bit of revenue that was available in like October, uh, and it was and it was essentially a gift to the schools. So that would be the other option uh, to do it that way. And then we added that to the base for the following year's calculation of assessment. Okay, uh, Paul. Yeah, so I just think for the purposes of this meeting, we've conveyed the information that you know uh, what we want to convey about the four percent, how the schools look at it. That's really not a topic for this conversation, this meeting, it's not on the agenda really. And so I think that's a, can talk about, be talked about tomorrow. Um, but for this group who's in this room right now, the, what we want to convey was the updated projections and, and get sort of a nodding approval that this we're in line with what the, what the uh, town council's financial policies say, we just divided up equally and I haven't heard anything in opposition to that. So I don't know if there's anything else we need to do other than listen to public comment. Okay. Any other comments from people here uh, within this group before we move to public comment? Okay, then the floor is open for public comment. If you were in the audience and you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. I see one hand. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment at this time? Okay. Um, Athena, I'm going to ask you to just allow Madalena uh, Kopi to uh, speak without bringing into the room. And do you want to say the guidelines for public comment? Yes. Um, public comment is uh, something that we include in most of our meetings for the town council. Uh, we are going to limit you to three minutes, and we want to make sure that you understand that we will not respond to your any direct questions, although we certainly are glad to listen to them, and you may find that we address them at some future time. Please go ahead, Madalena. I'm sorry, Lynn. Uh, Can you also add that the comment right now is for matters within the jurisdiction of the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comments are for the matters within this jur jurisdiction of the budget coordinating group. Um, hi, I'm Madalena Kopi, and I've never done this before. I was, <laughs> I'm one of um, a growing group of parents who are worried about the cuts being proposed for the elementary school that the school committee is planning to make in order to balance its budget. We're particularly concerned about cuts to the special education program and to the um, the instrumental education program. I'm I'm not a representative of this group. I'm just the one who decided to write to the town council and was told to attend this meeting. So here I am, and um, you know, the cuts to the elementary school programs represent about half of the budget cuts that the school committee is is proposing to make to staff. And um, special education and musical instruction are important to our children. And I'm here because I was wondering, well, what if we could get the school committee some more money from the town, you know? So is that possible is what I'm asking. And, um, you know, then the school committee wouldn't have to make these hard cuts. Um, we're all in the process of learning how everything works. And that's why we're asking this question. Are there reserve funds that could be diverted to the schools to prevent Staff, you know, staff that work with children every day from being cut, if there are, then we would be supporting of them getting shifted over. And are there ways that the town council or your committee can put us in touch with other entities, perhaps the universities, we don't know, that could get a little bit more money to our schools, then we would work with you on that. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us and making public comment. I see no other hands for public comment. So unless there's other people who in, in the group that is here for this meeting have any final comments they'd like to say, please raise your hand at this point. And seeing none, I'm going to call the meeting of the budget coordinating group adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.